am Joel McLeod. And I'm Roland Tanner. And welcome to the Metal Fiber. It seems that this summer, or at least this year, has been the year of the tent. Tent encampments, more specifically. They were first an issue during the pandemic. Since then, however, they seem to have only grown and become, quite frankly, a crisis in our cities. This summer, homelessness is inescapable. It seems that in our cities, you cannot walk a block without finding someone who is homeless, living in an alcove, walking our streets, or sleeping in a tent in a park. There are, of course, numerous reasons as to why someone becomes homeless, and for the majority of the time, it's never a choice that the person makes intentionally. However, as housing prices continue to rise and supply fails to meet with demand, more and more people are suffering the economic consequences of our housing crisis. More and more families and people are homeless as we struggle to meet the demands for adequate and affordable housing. To that end, we wanted to devote the next few episodes to this topic from opposite points of view. One from the grassroots perspective of the problem and another from the perspective of those holding the levers of power in the 905. Our first episode on this series, we reached out to the Ontario Alliance to End Homelessness. Michelle Bielak joins us. Michelle is a grassroots advocacy worker with the Ontario Alliance to End Homelessness, as well as the founder of the Peel Alliance to End Homelessness, and is a national organizer for the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness. She is a former candidate for multiple levels of government, and works with representatives from all levels to raise awareness and find solutions to the housing and homeless crisis in Canada today. She joins us. You looking to make the most out of this life and optimize your personal wellness? Then check out the Natural Man podcast. Join me, host Mike C., as we explore all areas of human wellness, physical, mental, and emotional. Learn strategies to optimize your own well-being and be in the driver's seat of your own health. Remember, your doctor works for you. Learn biohacks, neurohacks, ways to improve sleep, and ways to optimize your body and your mind. Check us out on Apple, Spotify, the Fountain app, and at naturalmanpodcast.com. Thank you uh, to Michelle Bielek uh, from the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness uh, for coming in to, to speak with us today on this, this very important issue uh, that I think has kind of been at the forefront, but tucked somewhat into the background for this past year. Uh, Michelle, thank you for, for coming on to the podcast today. Well, thank you very much for having me today. Uh, I want... I, I think for most of our listeners, as, as they drive through their communities in the 905, Anecdotally, I think we can all say we've seen an increase in homelessness. I know in Hamilton, there's talks of the, the, there's tent encampments uh, located throughout the city. It's kind of been a feature in a few communities. And I myself just noticed there's a greater increase in homelessness, homeless people sleeping in parks, alcoves, walking the streets than, than previous years. Mm-hmm. As somebody who say this, is, is are we seeing that or is this, just is our attention being drawn to this uh, for, for whatever reason this year? No, I think we're all definitely seeing it. Um, my, in my experience in, in doing this work, it's uh, probably got to catastrophic levels at this point. Um, and I think that a lot of people, just everyday folks who are just walking down their streets um, notice people at the street corner, you know, asking for money in, in storefronts. Um, they're going to the park with their, with their children. And it's not unusual for people to be certainly maybe not tent up, but at least, you know, there's remnants of, of, of people actually sleeping outdoors, whether that be furniture or sleeping bags or the individual themselves um, just, you know, being able to, uh, find a space where they feel safe. Um, and so I'd have to say that it's, <laughs> it's, it's not a figment of your imagination. It's a reality. And uh, it's particularly because I, 
I'm, I'm certain, and it's going to get worse. And we're, and we're seeing a new wave of homelessness because of the un, unaffordability of housing. That seems to be the core issue, whether we talk to uh, people with lived experience who are experiencing homelessness currently, um, it is going to be affecting many other folks, newcomers, refugees, um, students, and uh, you know, if you look at if you look at the data in Peel and actually throughout Ontario or Canada, um, the numbers don't lie. We are seeing uh, a definitive uh, influx, uh, or it's, I would have to say, you know, of people experiencing homelessness. This, um, uh, just looking at your website and and the the uh, something. Um struck me uh, that I've heard a number of times over the years from, from people who work at organizations such as yours, just, which is this, we should, this should be an unacceptable problem. We, we should be able to end homelessness for good forever. Uh, I've heard the same from, from poverty reduction groups, mm -hmm. uh, obviously the sort of close relationship between the two. And yet year after year, decade after decade, it seems that we're not only not making progress, uh, on reducing homelessness and poverty, uh, but actually going backwards, um, and and you know we're seeing in places like Hamilton lots of good intentions get bogged down in. There was a debate last year about the tiny shelters project and all kinds of uh, good intentions seeming to get um, bogged down and not really get anywhere. And it's like, well, here we go again. You know, nothing is really ever going to change. Why do you think it is that 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 it's such a perennial problem um, before we even get to the, the, the particular crisis that we're, that we're dealing with now? Mm -hmm. Well, it's no secret that it, there has been decades upon decades of underinvestment in accessible, affordable, and appropriate housing for people. Uh, that's just a fact. Um, what we have seen historically is in times of crisis, actually, the federal government's actually stepped up and was able to provide uh, social housing, community-based housing uh, funding for, for people uh, on the ground. And that happened, obviously, after the wars. Uh, but it also happened during the economic crisis as well uh, in the early 80s. So, you know, quite honestly, Ever since that point in time, I would say, you know, early 80s and on, there has been no investment from our federal government in affordable, accessible, or appropriate housing for people. And it was not actually until, believe it or not, the Stephen Harper government came in and uh, started to provide direct funding to communities to provide uh, services to people experiencing homelessness. And that was under what was called the homelessness partnering strategy. But beyond that, and there was nothing. And so we're, we're at a place where cooperatives and social housing providers who were able to take out mortgage with the federal government are, are seeing an end of mortgage. So we're going to see those properties um, being lost. Uh, you know, what we do see also is obviously both of you know that we had a downloading of, of many responsibilities to the municipal level, one of, one of which was homelessness and housing, but affordable housing, community housing uh, to the municipalities. And what we also know is that the municipalities has, have very few uh, fiscal tools in their toolbox to support all these programs and services. So, you know, whether it is roads, fire, EMC, uh, public health now, housing and homelessness, they're completely outstretched to be able to, uh, you know, maintain what existing stock there is, let alone be able to build new stock. Uh, so in, in addition, we've also seen, because of the lack of funding and underinvestment, we've seen, private actors come in and we've seen the financial financialization of housing throughout Canada. So, you know, whether it's the establishment of REITs um, who actually don't have to pay any, any sort of corporate taxes and investing in, in large swaths of properties um, or 
actually, you know, private entities that are even, that are even based in Canada, um, you know, buying and purchasing properties that people can't live in and or are vacant. In addition, we've seen also um, many private actors take advantage of, of the loss of some of those affordable housing uh, or renovations happening as well. So it's, it's a com compounding issue of many various different things. I think um, the lack of policies, uh, you know, on the municipal level, you know, we're seeing issues around whether it's, it's zoning or bylaws, um, you know, we're seeing obviously a, a lack of support for not-for-profit housing providers to actually access uh, lands and build. Uh, and, you know, again, I think that, you know, we have almost like a chess game play, <laughs> playing out with, with all our levels of government. Specifically, you've seen the refugees who are sleeping, or mm -hmm. actually there are uh, asylum seekers coming into Canada you know, seeking supports that they were promised and sleeping on cardboard on the streets in Toronto. And, and you know, they're, they're, they're punting responsibilities to all other levels of government without any government taking accountability. And it, it's, it's very frustrating and it's, and it's sad because, you know, people, everyday people want to see, you know, our human rights obligations upheld. Mm -hmm. And that, yes, you're right. Um, we all wish to see the end of end of homelessness. And it's it's again, it's been a long time coming. And now, like I said, we're at catastrophic levels uh, and uh, it, it's, you know, our, just, our responsibility to actually, you know, provide solutions to those levels of government so they can do the right thing. On on that note, on the the that some of the things that you're touched upon, I, I do, I want to get your, your response to um, something that Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said uh, this week, basically when he, was, when he was pressed on the housing crisis in, in this country, he looked and he said, uh, basically housing is not a federal responsibility. And I'm wondering what, what's, what's your take on that? What, what's your response to that statement? Yeah, they, I, I, I really do think he meant that it's, not well for one thing um they don't provide they don't build <laughs> is what i'm saying it's developers who actually build right and municipalities will say the same thing they they don't build it's actually like developers and not for profit housing providers that that do the building um so that may may have been what he actually meant but um you know the cmhc which is the canadian mortgage and housing corporation um, does actually provide uh, financial supports and loans and as well as, uh, you know, basic grants to uh, municipalities or not-for-profit or even for-profit uh, housing providers uh, to build housing. So uh, CMHC is actually, well, it's an NGO, right? So it's a non-governmental organization. So I guess, you know, he's, he's basically sort of being correct when he's, when he says that. Um, and second, second of all, it is actually, un the, you know, the housing portfolio is at the, is at the provincial level. Um, and they set out many of the parameters around where to build, how to build, uh, and uh, and provide direct funding. So the federal government gives funding to the province and the province is supposed to siphon money down to the municipalities uh, to support them with infrastructure. Um, so I, I would have to say it's it's sort of sad because it was the federal government actually who was stepping up and a lot of our, our work and our advocacy has been around you know, providing the tools and uh, and solutions that the federal government could be implementing uh, in order to uh, address the affordable housing crisis in, in this country. Um, but certainly they do have the Minister of Housing and Infrastructure, and he provides the policies that are, and the, and the follow through is actually through CMHC for in infrastructure, but also what's called Reaching Home, which is the program and service delivery uh, funding. 
uh, that siphons through to communities as well. So they do actually have a, a, a large responsibility um, by putting the policies in, in place in order for the uh, other levels of government to uh, implement. The, 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 I mean, certainly the, the, the current provincial government has, has passed a lot of legislation to that has an effect on housing generally uh, and development in particular generally. Um, how do you see, I mean, has that helped at all? I mean, it's, it's very much been marketed um, or, or by, by the provincial government as, you know, this is how to, how to solve the housing crisis. Has what they've been doing uh, with regard to changes to the Planning Act with uh, development charges, all the rest of it, is that actually addressing the, the problem that you face with affordable and low-income housing? Yeah, that's a really good question, and I would say no. <laughs> um, I in I do believe that uh, you know again I, I do I do think that we obviously do need a lot more housing, and but a complete landscape of housing is what is what we need, and unfortunately, uh, what. What I'm seeing is a government that's saying, yes, let's build, build, build. Um, but they're not providing, I would say, the necessary oversight and policies as, as well as actually sometimes uh, developers, uh, you know, they, they need to have, you know, some sort of incentive to actually build affordable, right? Um, and so we're not really seeing that ha- that happening, uh, at least from what I've seen in our communities, there's a heck of a lot of condominiums built that are like 400 square feet and cost over a million dollars. And to be honest with you, I don't think any, you know, working individual uh, who's actually making a a pretty good salary would even be able to afford uh, a mortgage of that, uh, of that size or, or, or a property of, of, with, you know, of that cost. So, uh, you know, there is information out there that the, that the province could be using that actually has assessed what the core need is in each community. There, there is a, a, a great tool that has been uh, public made public um, from the University of British Columbia, and it's called the Heart uh, Assessment Tools. And what they have done is they've been able to access uh, data information, uh, including census data, and be, been able to break down the who is in core housing need. So demographically, who is in core housing need? What is the core housing need in communities throughout Canada, including here in the GTA in Peel? So we have a good sense. Okay, so when we're building, what is the type of housing do we need in our community, right? And here in Peel, it is it is that affordability, that low, low and deeply, you know, funded or supported housing that that needs to be developed here. And so the the data is out there. So I think that they have it wrong. It's literally like, okay, we have to build, so let's just build. But what you should be looking at is what is the need in our province or what is the need in our community? What is the cost? And then moving forward (laughs) on on creating an opportunity for a plethora of different housing providers to build Mm. that housing. That, that is needed in the community. So it's it's almost like, well, let's just build and, you know, uh, here you go developers, here's peace land and go for it. Uh, but we also know that developers, you know, they're, they're in the business, they wanna make a profit, right? So knowing that as well, what incentives even can we give for profit developers in to, mm-hmm. to ensure that, you know, some of those units are, family size units, for example, some of those units are accessible units, for example, but some of those units should be also affordable and deeply affordable because that is the need in our communities throughout Ontario. Um, So the data is out there. The information is out there. Um, I just am not too sure if a lot of politics comes into play, um, you know, when it, when it comes to sort of making these decisions. I mean, I, I, as you can tell from my accent, grew up in a 
a different part of the world and I grew up it, it, somewhere in a country that had uh, you know very large supplies of, of public housing that were built and maintained by municipalities it's basically the biggest landlord in every town would be the municipality itself okay. and so I look around here and go where's all the public housing and and why is why why do municipalities basically own and run very very small supplies of, of housing is it as simple as Canada needs to catch up with other places in the world and think, hey, if you're going to have large supplies of affordable housing, you need to pay for it. You need to, in some way, you need to, like you say, create the incentives, um, which basically incentives is a money uh, to to encourage developers to actually build affordable housing because you know all those community housing or whatever in in the UK or in other places in Europe or elsewhere in the world, whenever I see it, it w- was paid for by the public sector in one way or the other. Mm-hmm. Um, is that a fair characterization? Oh, ab- absolutely it is. I, and I completely agree agree with you. It's, it's not, I mean, if you look at, you know, even the hard assessment tool has access to w- w- like property, right? So, so who, who owns land? So, you know, gov- different levels of government can find out, okay, so what, what is, what is our, let's do a scan. What is our land scan? What land is available? Where, you know, where could we build municipalities, you know, would be able to access that, that information as well. And, and maybe negotiate some, some of, so some of those agreements um, with respects to other levels of government on accessing those lands and being able to, to build. But again, I think, I think, um, you know, what we saw in the 80s and 90s is a lot of municipalities, including my my own, were literally selling off, uh, you know, the lands that they had to de- to developers um, in order to keep the, the tax and taxes low in, in, in our community. And and I'm pretty certain that that was the status quo during that time period. So a lot of the a lot of the properties are, are, as well are, are just owned by developers who are who are just sit, sitting on the land and waiting for the right time, and you know, obviously, um, the you know their ability to build. So, yeah. The, 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 now you you uh, in Peel and Peel is kind of your area of specialist interest, and you 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 co-wrote uh, a really interesting piece in in the uh, in the Pointer uh, po- uh, website mm-hmm. uh, uh, about what's happening with the with the breakup of of Peel region. Um, yeah into unitary uh unitary municipalities um what, what's happening there i mean and, and was was when the decision was made to, to break up peel did anybody actually think about things like um hey what about homelessness and uh and how we deal with that yeah it's uh, literally um I, my sense is it was quick <laughs> it was quick and i don't think that any elected official knew that it was going to come come so quickly and uh, without any sort of, I don't know, like, here's a heads up, <laughs> you know, this is what we're going to be doing. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, it was a few, there was a few, uh, obviously, conversations at municipal councils uh, about the, about the issue. And, and it's going to be coming down to, it is going to be coming down to, down to money. Um, uh, but what, what I've heard is yeah, there's a, there's a lot of conversations happening between the three municipalities here around who owes who owes who who owes what to who which municipality. It's like a chess game happening, um, and that they're all vying for checkmate because they all you know you know are arguing about what what they did or what they didn't or what they got and and what is owed. Um, and I think that that's a complete distraction by. Uh, you know, uh, what about all the programs and services that have been serving, you know, uh, people, citizens th- throughout our community over, you know, the last 30 plus years, um, what's going to happen happen to them? And, you know, I kind of think, well, you know, if we don't uh, start mobilizing together as a community and ensure that those conversations are are being had, obviously with our elected officials when they have those conversations with the transition board, but also us as a community coming together and and a unified uh, manner to speak for those who can't speak for themselves on, you know, what is direly at stake 
you know, in in the dissolution of, of of the region, and that we don't want to be left out. And you know, all all of these service providers provide services again from Caledon all the way down to Port Credit. And uh, you know, how is that going to play out? Now the municipalities are obviously going to have their own, you know, public health, um, you know, their own housing portfolio and as well as obviously overseeing homelessness. And so, so for, for us, as you know, at the Peel Alliance and homelessness and many of the other service providers around the table, we're obviously concerned about for one, keeping the lights on in our own organization as a lot of the funding uh, for all of, uh, all of these organizations will fl- flow through um, the region as being the service manager or from the federal level as the community entity. And so what's going to happen there, as well as many other extensive pr- programs and services that we've been providing the community um, around certainly ending homelessness and, and data collection. But yeah, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be, I think, <laughs> you know, they haven't, the, the province hasn't, you know, been secretive about the fact that we're just starting here with Peel and they're going to be doing the dissolution of most of the regions throughout the the province. So if it's not done right here in Peel, um, it as the template for what will be happening in other communities, um, you know, I, I just, yeah, I, I, I don't I don't want to think that far ahead, um, but I'm I'm hoping that uh, the province does step up and and support the municipalities as they take on many of these responsibilities and that the municipalities ensure that program and service delivery um, is sustained and uh, that the people we serve, uh, the most vulnerable people we served are at the forefront of their mind when they're making decisions. Um. That, it's a fascinating uh, point we, we had on uh, Bonnie Crombie uh, a few weeks ago, uh, a few episodes back, folks, go back, take a look. Uh, we're just before the announcement came down. Um, and that was something we kind of hinted at and the, the assumption was that it was all going to work itself out in the end. So it's, but it, you're right. It's something we'll have to take an, an eye, keep an eye on as it goes forward. The question that came out of my mind as you were describing that is, Coming back to like the issue of, of homelessness, housing, I think, is the number one issue for a lot of people, not just in Peel or the 905, but I'm going to say in the entire country, is the housing affordability. And yet, it seems that our all three levels of government, municipal, provincial, and federal, cannot get their act together on this. And, and I'm, as, some, as a grassroots organizer, as a grassroots organizer who, who is in touch with people who are on the ground, who are on the cusp of losing their homes people who are struggling to get into the housing market or to find housing in general. Do you take this as a case of our elected leaders are just out of touch with what's going on on the ground these days? Yeah. Uh, that's a really good question as well. Um, I would have to probably say absolutely. Um, you know, both of you have been in politics before and the cycle of elections uh, and, you know, sustaining your party in government is always on the back of the mind of elected officials. Um, and uh, so, you know, when, you know, me and uh, on the local level or my organization or the allied networks that I work with have those conversations with power holders, um, you know, we, 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 we know that that's what they're thinking, right? And so, um, you know, the work that the Canadian Alliance has done or even the Peel Alliance has done or the Ontario Alliance has done in the many allied networks that, that I work, work with from an intersectional approach to housing affordability and homelessness, um, you know, we want, we are here to provide the solutions. And uh, we have a plethora of research on best practices. You know, we have, uh, we have researchers, you know, we have policy makers who have been doing extensive work on, on these issues for a very, very long time. And, uh, you know, really what it does is what, to me, it's just, I, I'm, 
it's sometimes when I have those, it's like they, they, they understand that this is the need, but they don't have access to the how. But then also, I think that they're afraid to go too deep because they don't want to lose the next election, right? Because again, this is going to be, it's, it's going to hurt. It's going mm-hmm. to be expensive. We have, again, decades of underinvestment in housing and supports for people. You know, it, there, there's no question that it's going to be very expensive. So is it going to be something that they really, you know, dig deep into? Because this sort of piecemeal funding, this little bit, you know, support here, support here, you know, you know, the, you know, a bit, a bit of this from, from, uh, you know, from, from, for, for your groceries, it's, it's not getting anybody out of, of the situation they're, mm-hmm. they're in, especially people experiencing homelessness. So it's, costly. Um, building takes a heck of a lot of time, right? So any new build pre-con, it takes anywhere from five to seven years to develop. Um, so are there innovative solutions to that, right? Our prefab housing, um, modular housing, um, incentives for developers, um, you know, being able to make purchasing existing rental stock less economically attractive to, to REITs, Right. Um, You know, create an acquisition fund for NGOs, you know, uh, again, uh, you know, push the province for tenant protections, you know, the Canadian Alliance. Just before the federal government, we, we said, hey, you know what, we understand we're here to support you. Here's what we think. Considering the fact that we can't build fast enough, we know there's a huge wave of homelessness happening. Um, How about. Uh, you know, providing folks with a, a homelessness prevention and housing benefit. And we even, even laid out the cost of doing it. Um, but unfortunately, uh, you know, other issues were more of a priority at hand. So, so you know, it, 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 it's, it's, really, it's really difficult. We understand the dynamics um, of, of politics and, and the cycle of, ele- of elections. Um, but you know, quite honestly, if we're not at a crisis now, I can't, uh, you know, I, I, I really don't, don't know what to say, um, except that um, we, all, we all have to be invested. We all have to be okay with our taxes, you know, being raised, whatever the case may be, um, because it's costing us a heck of a lot of more, a lot more to have people living on the streets and um, in, in precarious situations. And on that note, um, you had mentioned that the last time uh, the federal government invested or built housing was the 80s. So I'm not a genius, but if you do the quick math, we're coming four decades of inactivity on this file. We're going to create, we're now entering into our fifth decade uh, of, of no building, not, no investment in this file at all. That gap, it, does that mean that we are so far behind that we can't make up for it? Uh, you know, it, are, are we just, do we just keep our eye off the ball for so long that we are, is it possible to, to play catch up that far back uh, from, from activity on, on this file? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd like to say, yes, <laughs> I'm always optimistic because, because that's my job. Uh, you know, I, I do believe in the end of homelessness, like resolutely, um, you know, but we do need to, uh, do a lot of various different things, whether, you know, increase affordable rental housing stock, um, you know, building, you know, literally hundreds of thousands of units, um, you know, putting in place mechanisms to ensure that those end of mortgages to those af- affordable housing uh, providers and in, in municipalities um, is renewed, uh, you know, ensuring that, you know, there's, certain tenant protections in place, um, you know, being able to provide, like I said, you know, in the meantime, uh, some sort of um, housing benefit for people to access whatever housing that there is out there with, you know, being, being able to find out what vacant properties there, there are, uh, vacant units there are, um, you know, implement other best practices on, on ending homelessness, such as, 
you know, reinstate housing first in the national housing strategy um, and reaching home. There's, I think that, that there are many things that we can do um, and we really just have to do them quickly and we need leadership, <laughs> right? In order to prioritize some, some of these solutions um, on all levels. On, on, on all levels instead of p- passing the buck uh, to other levels of government um, and, and not bearing responsibility because we are all responsible, including each and every citizen uh, to help out uh, our, fe- our, fe- fe- well, our fellow, um, you know, community member uh, living on the street and whether that's, you know, making donations to the food bank or supporting, supporting people in, in, in various different other ways. So um, that is our responsibility. That is who we are. If we have, you know, if we've learned anything from, from Tommy Douglas and universal health healthcare, um, you know, it is literally an, uh, you know, an approach where we have to, you know, make, make sure that everybody is taken care of. That is our value and, you know, housing affordability, the right to housing in Canada should also be, be our value. It should not be, uh, it not should not be our nest egg for when we when we retire at the end of, end of the day. It should not be a commodity. Housing is a human right, and uh, you know since the federal government did implement uh, right to housing le- legislation at the federal level, um, we have to actualize that, and we have to actualize that by yes, big dollars and pretty quickly. <laughs> it's I mean the the. Um... You've outlined sort of a wide range of things which we need to do, and and like you say, a big and expensive need ultimately that the government needs to get to grips with. Knowing how how politicians tend to think in 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 quite simple terms, uh, and of simple wins that they can kind of throw in front of the public and say, "Look, look what we did, and it happened quickly." I mean, is there something, you know, is there one thing you could kind of pick out of all those things that would be a kind of relatively easy win for a level of government, whichever level it might be, um, that isn't being properly thought about now, but they could actually do, and it wouldn't um, maybe, you know, it'd be something that could be done and get us going in the right direction at least. Yeah. One thing, (laughs) one thing it's, one thing is difficult, but I do think it's an unfair uh, question. I admit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but I'll 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 just say a couple of things just mm-hmm. from from the federal perspective again. Um, some sort of homelessness and how and 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 housing benefit, uh, so that people can remain housed as well as so that people can access housing. Um, I th- I think is so important. Um, and and I'd also quite frankly, like to see greater alignment between uh, the different ministries. And that's provincially and, and, and federally. You know, there, there is, it, it is such an intersectional issue happening here, right? So why, why isn't health healthcare talking to housing? Because they're all interrelated, right? You know, why isn't even, you know, uh, you know, veteran services, you know, talking with housing for, for example, right? Why isn't disability talking with housing? Because they're all interrelated. Or quite honestly, you know, you know, women and gender diverse issues and 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 housing, they're all interrelated. So literally, it can't just be like one portfolio or under, you know, oh, under all everything's all of our, you know, that you know, tools are going to be put under CMHC or or you know, uh, reaching home. It has to be literally housing. And funding for the housing has to be every single portfolio <laughs> throughout all of the ministries, throughout all levels, because, uh, you know, literally, if, if you talk to any service provider who's, you know, servicing students, for example, or student, servicing newcomers and refugees, you know, or, or uh, you know, women's organization, the VAW sector, um, again, you know, food banks, no matter, you know, who you talk to, they, the core issue to them isn't necessarily that they're, they're not getting paid enough, which is another full, we could probably do another podcast on that <laughs> issue. Um, but they will say people can afford to live 
in this community anymore. They can't afford their housing. And that was the reason why they ended up couch serving. That's the reason why they end, ended up, you know, um, living in congregate settings of some sort. So, you know, it's, um, it is the core issue and it has to be literally um, the top of the line issue in all ministries, you know, uh, in all portfolios uh, moving forward, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I'm seeing that we're coming up on our, our time for the episode. So I'm going to call it an end for, for this one, but uh, thank you, Michelle, for, for coming on. Uh, I, I think that's going to be a, a topic for the next foreseeable future. So um, thank you very much for sharing your expertise. Um, we'd like to have you back on at some point in the future, just maybe a follow-up and who knows, maybe we solved homelessness in the Maybe that's good news. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> maybe, I, maybe, but I, I'm optimistic. Yeah. I, I, you have to be in this, in this work. <laughs> yeah. Well, good, good on you, but thank you very much for coming on and uh, all the best for your, for your work. Well, thank you again for having me. I, I really appreciate it. And hopefully we'll have a chance to speak again soon. <laughs> That's it for this episode of the 905er. Thank you for listening. As always, you can send us your feedback, thoughts, and concerns, or ideas for future episodes to our email, info at 905er.ca. We'd love to hear from you. You can help us keep the 905er going by financially supporting us through Patreon as well as PayPal. Visit us at 905er.ca and click on the support tab. As well, links are in the show notes for your convenience. Lastly, you can find us on social media. Search for the underscore 905er on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. So long for now. See you next time.